Today we are looking at a case from the mid-19th century. So sit back as we go to England. Thomas Briggs was a fine gentleman, well-liked and well-respected. He was hard-working, considerate and dignified. Born in the county of Lancashire at the end of the 18th century, he had lived through a period when male life expectancy was just 40 years old. Diseases like cholera, smallpox and tuberculosis had been commonplace while he was growing up and many considered that he had done well to reach the age of 69. He had seen many changes take place in Britain. The first railway opened in 1825, running from Stockton to Darlington and when he was 42 years old in 1837, Queen Victoria was crowned Queen. Thomas was married and had six children and although he was born in Lancashire, he had spent most of his life in London. He had a good position, working for Roberts Curtis and Company, who were a bank based at number 15 Lombard Street, and he would travel daily from his North London home in Hackney to work. It was just a few stops on the train. By the mid 19th century, London had grown to become the largest city in the world, with the world's largest ports. It was also a city at the heart of international finance and trade. The Industrial Revolution had created new industries and the railway had connected London to the rest of Britain. The Great Exhibition of 1851 had been visited by more than six million people and as industry and trade increased, Thomas was kept very busy in his role at the bank. On the 9th of July 1864, Thomas went to see his niece Caroline Buchan and her husband who lived in the town of Peckham, just a short distance from the city of London. After taking tea, he left their home at around 8.30pm and Mr Buchan accompanied him to the bus stop. Thomas looked every inch the fine city gentleman. He had on his purse and his cane, a black bag, his elegant hat and a gold pocket watch on a chain. It was a pleasant evening and many people were out, enjoying the end of the long summer day. The bus arrived at Fenchurch Street Station, where Thomas got off and purchased a first-class ticket to Hackney. The train arrived and Thomas got on board. It was now 9.50pm and the train was quite empty. It was a short distance to his destination, just a few stops. Thomas sat down in his carriage. He was very familiar with the journey. He peered out of the window. It would not be long before he was home. At 10.10pm, the train pulled into Hackney Central Station. Two gentlemen, named Sidney Jones and Harry Vernes were waiting to board. They opened the door to the same first class compartment that had been occupied by Thomas. However, Mr Briggs was not there. Instead, there was a cane, a leather bag and a black hat, as well as a rather large amount of blood. The two gentlemen were very alarmed at what they had discovered and immediately informed the conductor. The conductor sealed the compartment and the train continued its journey to Chalk Farm Station. Unbeknown to the three gentlemen, the driver of the train heading in the opposite direction had stopped somewhere before Bow Station, as he thought that he had seen something strange upon the bank next to the train tracks. When he looked closer, he was horrified to discover that it was in fact a very badly injured gentleman. The train driver alerted a local constable named P.C. Dugan, and together, they carried the injured man to the nearby Milford Castle public house. The gentleman was badly injured and they managed to discover that his name was Thomas Briggs. PC Duggan made contact with his family and arranged for Mr Briggs' son to collect him and accompany him back to his house at Clapton Square in Hackney. Thomas Briggs, however, never recovered from his injuries and died the following evening in the presence of his wife and daughter. It was discovered that Mr Briggs was no longer in possession of his pocket watch and chain, but strangely, his wallet containing a significant amount of money was still on his person. The carriage where Thomas had been sitting was examined. There was blood on the seat, floor and door. The police believed that he had been attacked while he was sitting down, robbed of his chain and watch. Then his assailant had thrown him from the train while it had been traveling between stations. An autopsy confirmed that he had a fractured skull, plus wounds on his head and face, which was consistent with being hit with a blunt instrument 
and as there was also blood on the deceased man's cane, the police thought that this was probably the weapon used in the attack. Thomas Briggs's widow confirmed that the cane and the bag that was found in the carriage had belonged to her husband. However, the hat that was also discovered was not his. She said that Mr Briggs never wore a beaver type hat. She told the inspector that her husband was a distinguished gentleman who held a very responsible position in a firm of city bankers and he only ever wore a silk top hat. There was no such hat found in the carriage or following a search of the railway line. Inspector William Tanner of Scotland Yard was placed in charge of the case. The press had taken a great deal of interest in the incident. The murder of a gentleman travelling just a few stops on a train was of much concern to the general public and pressure was put on the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Richard Mayne, to solve the case. After all, the people of London should not be in fear when travelling on public transport. It was believed that this was the first incident of someone being murdered on a train, and soon the whole country was reading about it. But despite the fear that the story created, the police were able to use the press to help with the investigation. Inspector Tanner believed that the assailant would have tried to sell the watch and the chain taken from Mr Briggs, so informed the newspapers of the items that had been stolen. Soon after they were published, a London jeweller, somewhat strangely named John Death, contacted the police. He told them that a customer had visited his store and exchanged a gold chain, very similar to the one described in the newspapers, for a less expensive one and a plain gold finger ring. He had placed the items in an inexpensive jewellery box. Mr Death described the man as about 30 years old, 5 foot 7 inches tall, wearing a black hat. He also said that he spoke with a German accent. A few days later, a gentleman named Jonathan Matthews came forward and told the inspector that a young German named Franz Müller had visited his house a few days after the murder as a gift he presented his youngest daughter with a jewellery box. The box contained the name and address of the supplier, which was Mr John Death of Cheapside, London. Mr Matthews also told the inspector that he had a black beaver hat, which Mr Muller had very much admired. So as a gift, he had purchased one for him. Inspector Tanner made his way to Cheapside to speak to Mr John Death at the jeweller's shop. He showed him the jewellery box and without hesitation, Mr. Death confirmed that it was indeed the one that he had exchanged with the young gentleman who spoke with the German accent. Inspector Tanner, however, was concerned as to why it had taken Mr. Matthews so long to report his suspicions about Mr. Muller. Was it only because a substantial reward had been offered for information to help police solve the case? Mr. Matthews claimed that he did not read the newspapers. He was in charge of a horse-drawn cab and he said that while going about his work, he had heard people talking about the incident and only then realised that he may be able to assist the police with their inquiries. The police visited Mr Muller's address. They showed the hat found in the carriage to his landlady, named Mrs Ellen Blythe, and she said that she believed it belonged to Mr Muller. She also told the police that he moved out a few days earlier, on July the 14th. Inspector Tanner instructed his officers to find out as much as they could about the missing Franz Muller, and they soon discovered that the suspect was a young gentleman who was born on the 31st of October 1840 in Cologne in Germany. He had trained as a tailor, and when he completed his training, he came to London to try and take advantage of the better employment opportunities. He had found life hard, and the wages for a tailor were not as good as he had hoped. So still only 23 years old, he had decided that he would leave London and travel across the Atlantic Ocean to see if he could find a better life in New York. Inspector Tanner wondered if the young man may have already left England. After all, he had vacated his lodgings and exchanged items of jewellery. The inspector thought that the assault on Mr Briggs was motivated by robbery. The police wasted no time in contacting the ports and the shipping companies and they soon discovered that a man going by the name of Franz Muller had boarded a ship named Victoria 
which had departed for New York on Friday the 15th of July, less than a week after the attack on Mr Briggs. The Victoria was a sailing ship, which meant that it would take some time to reach its destination. Armed with an arrest warrant, Inspector Tanner and the witnesses Mr John Death and Mr Jonathan Matthews travelled by train to Liverpool and purchased tickets for the much faster steamship named the City of Manchester. This ship departed Liverpool on the 20th of July, five days after the Victoria, but was due to arrive a full two weeks before the much slower boats. Inspector Tanner planned that when the Victoria arrived in New York, the two witnesses could identify Mr Muller and he would arrest him. When the Victoria arrived, Inspector Tanner boarded the boat and detained the suspect. He then placed him in an identity parade where both Mr John Death and Mr Jonathan Matthews identified him as Mr Franz Muller. Although Mr Muller denied any involvement or knowledge of the murder of Mr Thomas Briggs, extradition documents were organised and the young gentleman was placed on a ship and escorted back to Britain. The trial of Franz Muller for the murder of Thomas Briggs opened at the Old Bailey on the 24th of October 1864 and the defendant pleaded not guilty. The case of the murder on the train and the journey across the Atlantic to apprehend the suspects had filled the newspapers and fascinated the public. Large crowds gathered outside the courtroom to get news of what was going on inside. The evidence against Mr Muller, however, was only circumstantial. No one had seen him on the train, let alone seen him commit the crime. One witness who was on the train claimed to have seen two men in the same first-class carriage as Mr Briggs, neither of whom he could identify as the defendant. The landlady, Mrs Ellen Blythe, told the court that Mr Muller did not seem at all different in the days following the murder and she did not witness any blood on his clothes. At the time of the murder, young Franz Muller had an injury on his foot, so for comfort, he often went out wearing one shoe and a slipper. A gentleman who worked on a horse-drawn omnibus told the court that he had seen such a gentleman on his bus. Under cross-examination, however, he was unable to remember the exact time and date the gentleman had travelled or confirmed that the person he saw was the defendant. A lady named Mrs Jones, who ran a house with young ladies, told the court that Mr Muller had called upon one of them at 9pm on the evening of the murder. Unfortunately, the young lady had gone out, so Mr Muller left. The prosecution, however, informed the court that the establishment Mrs Jones owned was a brothel and was frequented by many gentlemen. So Mrs Jones's memory of times and dates may not be very accurate. The defence reminded the court that Mr Jonathan Matthews was not a credible witness, informing the jury that he had previously been in trouble with the law and only came forward to the police when he realised that there was a reward for information leading to an arrest. There was, however, evidence that the prosecution skillfully demonstrated. When Mr Muller was arrested, he was found to be in possession of the watch that had belonged to Mr Thomas Briggs. The defendant claimed that he had purchased it from an unknown gentleman who was selling items at the dockside. There was also the hat found in the carriage. Only four had ever been made and the defendant was no longer in possession of the one Mr Matthews had given him. The defendant was, however, found to be in possession of a far more elegant silk top hat, which was also identified as having belonged to Mr Thomas Briggs. The trial ended on the 29th of October and the jury was sent out to deliberate. They returned 15 minutes later to find the defendant, Franz Muller, guilty, and the judge sentenced him to death. The verdict was appealed, and the German Legal Protection Society tried to get the sentence commuted to life in prison. Even King Wilhelm of Prussia was aware of the case and sent a telegram to Queen Victoria, asking her to have the execution delayed. The public and the press, however, were convinced that the young gentleman, Franz Muller, was guilty, even though he continued to protest his innocence. On the 14th of November, 1864, an estimated 50,000 people gathered outside Newgate Prison to witness the execution. People were cheering and jostling to try to get the best position to see the event unfold.
Although Franz Muller had repeatedly denied any involvement in the death of Thomas Briggs, it was reported that when he was asked if he had anything to say before he was hanged, he whispered in a quiet voice, Ich habe es getan, which in German means, I did it. The murder of Thomas Briggs brought about changes in the law. The train carriages were instructed to be installed with communication cords in which passengers could alert the guard or driver if they required urgent assistance. The execution of Franz Muller and the behaviour of the crowd also increased the debate regarding public executions, which eventually ended in 1868 following the introduction of the Capital Punishment Amendment Act. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next Brief Case.